My name is Tim Rowe, Executive Director of 3A Sanitary Standards, Inc. On behalf of our leadership, our education committee, and our faculty, I want to welcome you to our webinar series. These webinars were originally presented as part of our 2022 education program designed to clean, creating a hygiene-focused culture. We welcome you today to join a truly diverse group from across the United States and around the world who share a common interest in hygienic equipment design. Our participants include those who fabricate the equipment, those who use it, and those who are responsible for inspecting equipment and facilities. We especially welcome those who are participating for the first time in the 3A SSI event. Let me also recognize and thank the sponsors of 3A SSI. These companies have stepped up to show their support for the education mission of 3A SSI with a sponsored link on our website. Their support helps make this webinar possible along with many other vital education resources. Follow the company link on our website and visit these companies for more about their hygienic products and services. Since many participants joining us today are new to 3A SSI, let me share a very brief history about the organization. In the 1920s, two trade associations and one professional association formulated uniform standards for fittings used on milk pipelines. The standards became popularly known as 3A for the three associations. This cooperation between industry and regulatory experts continued over the decades. And in 1944, the US Public Health Service, which oversees the FDA, announced it would collaborate in developing uniform equipment standards. In 1956, the 3A symbol was introduced as a legal trademark for display on equipment that conforms to a 3A standard and other conditions of licensing. Through many decades, the number of 3A standards and accepted practices increased in number and in complexity. Today, we oversee an inventory of about 80 standards for equipment and accepted practices for processing systems. In 2002, this network of informal collaboration became organized in a modern not-for-profit 501c3 corporation. We are headquartered in McLean, Virginia, just outside of Washington, DC. This is probably one of the most important slides you'll see today because it conveys the long history of 3A and the important role it serves in supporting regulatory programs in the dairy industry. Now, as we head into the 2020s, 3A is entering the second century of service to the food processing industry. That's a long and rich history. Today, 3A SSI has three member associations that represent the same stakeholder groups of years past, fabricators, processors, and regulatory sanitarians. The Food Processing Suppliers Association is the trade association for suppliers to the food processing and packaging industry with more than 400 members serving a broad spectrum of industries, including bakery, beverage, dairy, meat, pet food, and prepared foods. The International Dairy Foods Association represents the nation's dairy manufacturing and marketing industry with a diverse membership ranging from multinational organizations to single plant companies, from dairy companies and cooperatives to food retailers and suppliers. IEFP, is a member-based association of more than 4,500 food safety professionals committed to advancing food safety worldwide. By providing food safety professionals with a forum to exchange information on protecting the food supply. The 3A SSI Board of Directors is composed of voting representatives from these associations, plus representatives of USDA and FDA, and the chair of the 3A Steering Committee, this is the committee responsible for overseeing all 3A standards activities. All of the corporate activities are now carried out by a single organization with its own governance structure and a dedicated professional staff. The support for 3A SSI operations comes mainly from the licensing program, sales of documents, meetings, and dues. 3A SSI today has vastly expanded and modernized its programs and resources dedicated to hygienic design, particularly in the past two decades. One of the driving forces for the new 3A SSI was to improve the integrity of the 3A symbol program used to identify equipment that conforms to a 3A sanitary standard. As we look to the future, I'm reminded of a widely known and well-regarded speaker who said something to the effect of, standards are good, but you don't need 3A. Sounds a little dismissive, but it's probably true. 
To be fair, there are many other voluntary guidelines and standards available, also very good, but you may not need them either. It's up to you to learn about what you do need. It all begins with sound education. It's worth pointing out that 3A is not strictly US, nor is it exclusively dairy. We note that of the three symbol authorizations on file with us, about 48% are held by US entities and 52% are held by international entities. The 3A symbol authorizations and certificates held by companies span about 22 countries outside the United States. We also see that 3A SSI document sales reach a very diverse group of customers in 40 countries outside the United States. And these are companies that are certainly outside of the dairy industry, uh, including beverages, pet foods, cereals, personal care products, wine, beer, and many other types of food applications. We also know that the key drivers for hygienic design, hygienic equipment design, are US dairy regulations, the Food Modernization Act, and corporate requirements. Looking across the landscape of other standards developers, 3A SSI offers a highly respected network of subject experts in hygienic design and high value education and training resources. Thank you for taking advantage of this education opportunity today. Before we begin, we urge you to explore the Knowledge Center and build these resources into your personal education or organization training programs. Here you'll find four basic e-learning modules on hygienic design and one advanced module, all at no charge. They're designed for all audiences, including equipment fabricators, food processors, regulatory sanitarians, as well as students and young professionals beginning their careers. No previous knowledge of hygienic design or a given topic is required. The 3A sanitary standard for general requirements, or simply the general requirements, is a compendium of terminology and requirements which are common to our standards and accepted practices. You may hear references to these requirements in today's webinar. This document is essential if you do plan to utilize 3A SSI resources for your future training and education. This document's available for purchase from 3A SSI through the link on our homepage. Don't forget to mark your calendar to join us for in-person education and networking next May in Bloomington, Minnesota. We'll have two days of education beginning with a special introduction to the foundations of hygienic design, followed by a day of special topics. We'll also conduct our annual meeting and workgroup meetings. Watch our website for the program schedule and details later this year. So let's begin today's presentations. Remember, the presentations you are viewing today are not live, but we still invite your questions or comments on the content. Please use the email you received with the access code for this program to submit your questions. We'll provide a response to your question from the presenter. You can also contact any 3A SSI staff member about other subjects. Now let us begin today's webinar. Hello everyone, I'm Monty Bohannon, Associate Director of Sanitation for Leprino Foods. But I am thankful for the opportunity to share some information and observations on dry cleaning of hygienic equipment focusing on dry dairy powder manufacturing, for which I'm most familiar. But I think most of the principles and discussions that follow will apply to other dry clean only processes as well. When processing dry dairy products, there's typically a fairly distinct line of demarcation between wet processing and dry processing. Of course, on the wet side of the plant or process, we can clean conventionally with water and cleaning chemicals with a high level of success. And until re recently, we would have taken the same approach when cleaning on the dry side of the operations. In our industry, we have discovered, however, that wet cleaning in our dry operations does not always lead to success. This has been true in other food manufacturing segments as well, such as dry cereals, bakeries, etc. So over the years, we have adapted a new course of action to remove soils without wet chemistry and water. This approach was taken to improve microbiological control, but we also need to consider allergen control some, sometimes. Both are food safety risks that must be addressed through cleaning. For microbiological control, the objective is to limit food and water availability for microbial growth. 
Then, to have an effective allergen control without sacrificing our microbial control, we must determine a way to remove proteins or allergens without chemicals, or at least minimizing it. Most of you are probably familiar with the four basic parameters for wet cleaning, illustrated by the pie on the left, with equal parts for time, temperature, action, and concentration. We say to ensure adequate cleaning, this pie must remain whole. So if we take a slice out of any segment of the pie, the other pieces of the pie must fill in. So in the case of dry cleaning, we are using no chemistry, no water, and most likely no temperature. We must invest a lot of time and mechanical action to make the pie whole and to get the job done, as illustrated in the pie on the right. This means a lot of elbow grease and man hours, so a lot of labor. Thus, typically, dry cleaning is heavily reliant on employee expertise and engagement. Employees' behaviors will determine the success of our cleaning process, so it requires training, techniques, and commitment. And since dry cleaning only takes a lot of time, dry cleaning needs to be 24-7, a continuous dry cleaning process. It takes a lot of work. So why in the world would we ever not want to wet clean? We have found that successful microbiological control in dry dairy processing is dependent upon eliminating moisture. Salmonella and Cronobacter sakazakii, CSAC, are primarily pathogens of concern, or there are primary pathogens of concern anyway in the dry dairy industry, because they have adapted to our processing environment, which is hot and dry. Both Salmonella and Cronobacter can survive for long periods of time without water by going dormant and waiting for the next introduction of water. If or more likely when they manage to get both food and water, they will multiply quickly and can even build biofilms to help better ensure their survival and growth the next time water is uh, introduced while they wait during the next dry period. In dry dairy processing, we go long periods of time between cleaning, dry cleans, and keep our equipment and environment hot and dry which tends to select for these pathogens of concern since other microorganisms will die off much more easily. The illustration to the right shows three parameters necessary for microbial growth, time, food, and water. There are others which we can also use as hurdles to limit growth, such as pH, atmosphere, temperature, etc. But these three are common across dry dairy product processing. Since we do not limit time, in fact, we often want to extend time as long as possible to maximize production, we want to minimize the availability of food and water. The products we make are very nutritious, used for infant formula, but also nutrient-rich for microorganisms. So we want to keep the food out of the environment as much as possible and not introduce any water. Then, inside our equipment, where we cannot limit or minimize food, of course, we must completely eliminate water to maintain microbiological control. Just to illustrate the point, we want to contain microorganisms by keeping them out of our plants with good building sanitary design and upkeep, represented by a full bag of grass seed. When that bag is sealed and sitting on the shelf in the garden shop or your garage, we can control the germination of the seeds. It's contained. However, if we inadvertently dump a bunch of seed in a clump on the ground, it's probably not going to grow very well. Not every seed will germinate anyway, and it's pretty easily picked up or even eaten by birds before it can germinate, but it's not really contained. And if we spread that seed around and it gets mixed into some soil where it now has nutrients available, we've supplied some food. And now it's harder to clean up and the seeds are ready to start growing just as soon as enough moisture is available when water is introduced into the picture. Now everything starts to grow. And although it looks pretty good, it looks nice, we actually don't want that lush photo on the right, where our seeds represent microorganisms and they have now fully taken root. This is why we have undertaken a war on water in dry dairy processing. So the keys to a dry clean only approach for microbiological control are minimizing food by keeping our product out of the environment. Do not introduce microorganisms into the environment by utilizing hygienic zoning and barriers and by continuously cleaning the environment with a defined process. We focus on the environment because most contamination and dry clean only comes from cross-contamination from the environment, post-pasteurization or post-lethality step, 
A defined cleaning process includes the proper procedures and techniques, but it also means having every task identified, assigned, uh, whether it's on the master sanitation schedule or part of a periodic equipment teardown or a clean and, or a periodic environmental deep clean, PM type schedule. Uh, we also want to protect our product contact zones. In dry dairy product, product processing, we say we have a closed system with our product inside the pipes and the environment outside the pipe. We strive to always protect the product contact services from the environment. So this necessitates taking extra precautions whenever we need to open our closed system, such as for inspections, magnet checks, maybe even sample collecting. We need to intervene to ensure there's no cross-contamination. So this means good GMPs. We must find ways to ensure that we are not allowing the environment into our closed system. And of course, we need to do all this without introducing any water. So it comes down to sanitary design and executing on a defined process determined by that sanitary design. Sanitary design should help us keep the environment out of our product. I'm gonna share a few such photos with you of equipment and room environments in an infant uh, formula manufacturer who happens to be a customer for our dry dairy powders. This is a relatively new plant and you'll see that they take great pride and effort in maintaining a clean and dry environment because they're making food for infants. Here you'll see a powder sifter where they have been in production for 11 days since their last deep dry cleaning. Now they've probably done some maintenance level cleaning in the environment, but the key here is that they are effectively keeping the product inside their closed system, inside the equipment. These sifters have a lot of vibration and movement, so there are a lot of opportunities for leaks from the closed system. I'll reluctantly but truthfully tell you that our sifters and sifter rooms do not look this clean. So this is a world's best type operation. From a microbiological control perspective, we don't want food in the environment, but also if product can get out of the closed system, there's also a possibility that the environment can get into that closed system. Here's another photo that shows their bin room, again illustrating a commitment to keep product inside the closed system and to remove any product from the environment. There's no powder leaks, no powder left in the environment from any tube changes or sampling or other operations. And as a testament to their dedication to keeping product out of the environment, on the day these photos were taken, our customer had a huge product spill in their packaging room into the environment where powder was everywhere. The operation was stopped and dry cleaning was performed to remove all product from the environment before production was allowed to re resume. This is the level of commitment needed to dry clean only. But the other illustration is the sanitary design of the equipment to keep the product out of the environment in the first place, and also the sanitary design and layout of the rooms to facilitate dry cleaning. We spend some time discussing microbial control of dry cleaning because it, that is our primary food safety concern in dairy processing. In the dairy process, dry dairy processing, we do not usually have to concern ourselves with allergen cleaning since our primary allergen is dairy. There are some concerns with soy lecithin or sunflower oil from time to time, but those ingredients can be allergen free also. However, some of our customers and co-packers find it necessary to attain allergen clean status in their operations, so they need to have procedures and methods for diligently dry cleaning in their dry blending and packaging operations. It is a challenge to say the least. We need to remove all traces of product that might contain an allergen, and we must verify and validate that we've been successful. We do not have the chemical breakdown of the allergen to rely on. Instead, we rely, we rely on physical removal of the potential allergen soils through vigorous brushing and wiping and or product purges, for instance, or perhaps using some sort of scouring on the inside of the equipment, utilizing salt or even just a coarser grain of the product. Product testing after purging or scouring is needed to establish procedures and validate the efficacy of the process. Inspection becomes critical to verify effectiveness and validate allergen removal, with different levels of inspection typically being utilized. So we might use a visual inspection, ATP swabs, allergen swabs. And we do the process where if we don't pass a visual clean, then we must go back and re-clean. We don't, if we are visually clean, but we fail in the ATP, then we have to go back and re-clean before we attempt going on to the next step to passing the allergen swab. And then of course, if we don't pass the allergen swab, we have to re-clean again. So it's documenting that we're taking each step to make sure that we are clean, to validate that we're allergen clean. Relying on scouring of equipment can lead to scratches and other damage to the equipment. So sometimes it might be necessary to utilize a modified wet clean. 
using alcohol wipes or localized wet cleaning. And even though we're using alcohol, we still call it wet cleaning because alcohol is most likely not 100% alcohol, but instead a mixture with water. This mixture is usually an azeotropic mixture, which promotes evaporation, but there's still a chance we might leave behind some moisture, especially if introduction of water changes the azeotropic properties and we are no longer evaporating water and alcohol at the same rate. So dry cleaning as much as possible is still the prerequisite. You got to get rid of as many soils from a dry cleaning perspective as possible. And then achieving a complete dry out afterwards becomes imperative if we're attempting any type of localized wet cleaning. We can't leave behind any moisture. Any wetted soils in the form of streaks or product residue are going to be potential food and water for microorganisms. Even if we do completely dry out all moisture and all the moisture evaporates, we must also ensure adequate air handling to control the relative humidity and keep moisture from condensing back onto cool surfaces. So visual inspection now includes looking for any signs of moisture as well as those soils, plus our ATP swabbing, then our allergen swabbing. So it's just a level, another level of complexity for allergen swabbing if we have to resort to some sort of a wet clean, which sometimes we do. If we are to be successful in implementing our dry clean only program, we must ensure we develop the following. The best hygienic design of the equipment and the facility to promote complete product removal that keeps product out of the environment and keeps moisture out of the environment. We also need a defined cleaning process with procedures that are effective and comprehensive, all encompassing, all -encompassing uh, detailed tasks, which then necessitates the proper tools for the job. And since we are so reliant on manual labor, we need consistent, uncompromising behaviors and execution achieved through training and supervision from an engaged workforce. Taking a deeper look at these components for effective dry cleaning, let's start with effective tools, where the vacuum is our preferred tool of choice. Vacuum cleaners need to be HEPA filtered so we do not reintroduce dust and contaminants back into the environment during the dry cleaning process. They must be explosion proof when that dust or soil being cleaned so dictates, as in our case, and they should be dedicated to specific rooms or areas. Vacuums can be viewed like drains in wet cleaning environment and from an environmental monitoring perspective. In wet cleaning, every, everything in a floor quadrant will end up in that drain. So we monitor the drain by swabbing for pathogens as a way to monitor the whole section of a room. The same can be done with a dedicated vacuum. By monitoring the contents of a vacuum, we are monitoring the entire area that was swept up by that vacuum. That's one reason why we don't recommend centralized vacuums, which would not allow for isolating specific rooms or levels or areas that are being vacuumed. The other reason for uh, the inability to effectively, is the inability to effectively clean that centralized vacuum should you have a hit. Just like drains, the interior of vacuum cleaners should be considered the dirtiest parts of the plant, the dirtiest parts of our dry clean only environment. Other tools for dry cleaning include brushes, scrapers, towels, to assist in knocking the soils down or otherwise collecting soils so they can be vacuumed up. We use the vacuum to contain the soils. So we collect them and we vacuum them up. We do not want these tools though to become hazards in and of themselves. So we want to use resin set brushes, for instance, where the soils can't get trapped inside the bristles. We want to use soft bristle brushes so we don't aerosolize particles back up in the air, just like uh, using a vacuum without a HEPA filter. Uh, we want color-coded tools color coded by hygiene zone that are, can be 5 best and job specific. Scrapers to be used with caution so we don't damage the equipment just like scouring can scratch the surfaces so can scrapers and they should be metal detectable. So we do not want to create another food safety concern. And we also uh, recommend using dry towels instead of wet wipes. There are electrosta electrostatic towels utilized in the microchip industry that can also be used in our applications to help remove dust, for instance. It'll help trap the dust a little bit better. But towels, just like scrapers, introduce the possibility of extraneous materials. In dry dairy processing, we typically do not use these alternative dry clean tools or methods. But I wanted to touch on them quickly because you may find them useful or even necessary in your applications, especially for achieving knowledge and clean. We do not like to use air, compressed air because it typically just leads to soils becoming airborne only to be redeposited on surfaces when they finally drift back down to earth. But it is possible to use low pressure air to more gently remove soils, knocking the soils down to the ground to be vacuumed off the floor, for instance. 
Dry steam cleaning provides some heat that may be necessary for allergen cleaning, but even though it's dry steam, it still will introduce some water. So dry out capability is critical. Dry ice is the opposite, not directly introducing moisture, but due to the cooling effect, use of dry ice can lead to frosting or condensation of moisture from the atmosphere, so where you have now have localized water available for uh, bacteria. And soda blasting can be an effective way for removing hardened or encrusted soils from a surface, but just like scrapers or scouring, you run the risk of damaging the equipment with the scouring action of the, of the soda blast. All of these methods tend to create a big mess in and of themselves. So they all require a plan for secondary cleaning after the cleaning process using any of these alternative tools, plus a strategy to contain the soils being blasted from spreading throughout the environment. In addition to effective tools, we also need a defined cleaning process and procedures. We need to have all tasks captured on our master sanitation schedule and periodic equipment or periodic infrastructure cleaning lists. And when completed, those tasks need to follow what we call the six steps of dry cleaning, which are pre-sanitation prep, secure and dismantle, pre-clean, detail clean, final clean, and then final inspection and documentation. So you can see there's, there's a uh, pattern there. We're repeating cleaning. That's because again, we say dry cleaning has to be 24 seven continuous process. Let's go into the steps of our defined process for dry cleaning in a little bit more detail. Step number one is pre-sanitation prep. And of course, this is removing all the stuff out of the area to be cleaned uh, so that we can get to uh, the surfaces that we want to clean and 5Sing everything uh, and also bringing in uh, our cleaning tools or uh, 5S. So the, the key here is to maintain our hygienic barriers and keep the product out of the environment in this process. So we don't we want to have dedicated things to the room and to that hygienic zone. Uh, and as we're moving things out, we don't want to dump product into the environment and create a bigger cleaning issue. Step two is to secure and dismantle, and this is important it's because we need to be, gain access to deep into equipment and the environment as we can for cleaning and inspecting. We can't, can't clean what you can't see, and we don't want to leave behind any soils that are potentially going to get uh, encrusted and become a potential harborage. The third step of, is to pre-clean, of course. And so the first round of dry cleaning, and we want to work the whole room, right? And so we want to clean everything. So we want to take a top-down approach. We want to sequence the entire room so that we're we're not redepositing soils as we move through the room. And and as we do this, we've got to protect our product contact services. So lots of times we might clean product contact first because that's where a lot of the soils might be, but then we want to clean the room, protecting those product contact services, and, and clean and then come back to the product contact services last. And the approach we want to take is to knock it down and again, vacuum it up. So we want to contain the soils as much as possible. So lots of times what we'll do is, is collect that soil up and then vacuum it to contain it. Our fourth step in our defined process is our detail cleaning. So now we've removed a lot of the initial cleaning with uh, our pre-clean, getting a lot of the loose dirt. And now we want to go after those hard to see or hard to clean areas. So we're going to remove all those hard uh, soils, which might take some scraping to get caked on soils uh, removed or, or any wetted soils, maybe from grease. Uh, and it, but again, the approach is to collect the soils to get it down to a point where you can vacuum it up and remove it. Our final cleaning is step five. And so now what we want to do is again, go back and work top down inside the room, sequence the entire room. And what we're doing now is seeking out those read, any redeposited soils. And we're really looking for those hidden soils, looking for those spots that maybe we missed the first time or in the, or are in very hard to clean spots, uh, tight spots. And we want to make sure that we're removing as much of the soils as we can. And if for some reason we've had to use a uh, wet wipe or, or something else, uh, we want to make sure we can we're completely dried out if we're going through. Sometimes we'll take uh, items out of our high hygiene zone to wet clean them somewhere. And if we're doing that, when we're bringing them back into our hygiene zone at this point, we want to make sure they're completely dried out, of course. And then finally, our last step is our inspection step. And that's really our most important step because we have to ensure that we, we've done all the things that we uh, said that we we're going to do and we have to document it. So here on our final inspection, we are looking for anything we've missed and any extraneous we might have left behind. But we're also documenting 
and making uh, and uh, filling out our MSS and our checklist because that's really the only documentation we have. We don't have chart recorders for CIP systems or electronic data that's collected that might uh, uh, document the cleaning operations. It's all manual, and so we need to make sure that we are filling out all of our forms and that we're doing all of our tests. So and all of our tests uh, from an ATP and an allergen swab test are completed and documented as well to show to validate that we've actually achieved our clean. Finally, knowing now some of our thought processes and available tools and limitations that we have, we need to consider what can we do to best facilitate dry clean only applications from a sanitary design perspective for both equipment and the environment in which the equipment will be housed also, keeping in mind the strong reliance that we have on our people. I think that clearly anything we can do to design equipment where a product is easily and completely removed or evacuated by promoting free flowing product will help with dry cleaning. We also need to design the system to be closed and protected from the environment, minimize the need to open and access the closed system. Maybe by designing split streams for sampling or by designing ways to isolate any intrusion areas into the system from the rest of the closed system. We need to keep the environment out of the product and the product out of the environment. And though we would prefer to eliminate all moisture, we need to make sure that we're able to ensure a complete dry out just in case moisture ever does get introduced. We've spoken about the advantages, but also the challenges of dry clean only uh, applications from a cleaning perspective. But our ability to sanitize in a dry clean only application is also limited and challenging. I'm not going into a lot of detail here, but I wanted to uh, at least list a few options that are out there that might work for your specific applications. Alcohol, as we've discuss discussed, can both clean and sanitize. Chlorine dioxide gassing can be used on small and large scales, but it requires special training and isolation of the areas and safety precautions, so please consult an expert. Uh, heat sanitizing, of course, can be used, especially if it's dry heat like the desert. And then there are some other uh, emerging or evolving options, such as dry steam that we've talked about, silver ion misting, pulse field ultraviolet light, amongst others. We're always looking for continuous improvement opportunities, and we should take that same approach when considering sanitary design, of course. So in summary, the following considerations will help improve sanitary design of equipment in dry clean only applications. We need maximum removal of product. We have limited tools and methods for cleaning and sanitizing. We must keep the product out of the environment and the environment out of the product. We must wage a war on water. Thank you all again for the opportunity and for your time and consideration. Have a great day. Thank you everyone and thank you Tim and others for the invitation to be here today. I think this is a great opportunity. I want to bring us back to some of the things we heard earlier today about culture and some of the elements also about training that we heard about today. So I often like to start some of my sessions on allergen control strategies, something we do in about two and a half days worth of workshop. We'll try to squeeze into about 30 minutes. But I want to bring that back to thinking about culture, thinking about training. So one way to do that is to better understand the audience. So how many people have a food allergy in this room? Okay, see about two, three hands. In a room this size, given what we think we know about prevalence, that's about accurate. We'd say about maybe one to perhaps 5% of the population have food allergies. If we extend that to celiac disease, we're going to be somewhere in that uh, 6 to 8% perhaps. Today we'll focus on those IgE-mediated food allergies, but again, celiac disease and controlling gluten is a key element as well. So. How many people know someone that they either work with or in their family that has food allergies? All right, now I want everyone to take a look at those hands. Keep them up. Look around the room. Okay, that is an important training tool when you go out to talk about food allergies in your facilities or with others in your companies. We're trying to train people and we've heard about that turnover and the challenges in the workforce currently, we're talking about 
nutritious food products that we're handling and actively making products with in facilities. Bringing that back to understanding why it's important to control this as a food safety risk is certainly a challenge for some to grasp. So seeing across the way that we not only have a few people that have food allergies, but we have people that are affected on a daily basis and across the team that we have here is an important part to think about when you start to look at you know, how to communicate the need and why we control food allergies. We've hit upon, again, some of the risks, the health risks that we have. We certainly have those severe and life-threatening reactions, unfortunately, fatalities that we sometimes hear about with food allergies. So we know that there are certain health risks. We have to control that. There's a key food safety risk. Encompassing that, we also have regulatory and business risks, and no one wants to put consumers at risk. So we have a lot of... Uh, key areas that we need to work on when we think about food allergies, encompassing that with overall food safety, food hygiene as well. Just giving you a perspective on where we're at with food allergens, here's information from the Reportable Food Registry from FDA. If we think about uh, where we're at in allergens and where that falls in RFR entries, reports, Fortunately, allergens are one of the key causes. We see that ranking about half comparatively to the other half, which are microbiological issues, pathogen issues. So with that, again, we've seen the, that continued trend, and we're seeing, again, a lot of those same allergens uh, they're in our facilities. So it's, you know, when we think about what's causing them, we see milk and egg, peanut, tree nuts, Again, nutritious products that are used in our facility, but we've got to be able to make sure they're in the, the product that we're intended to be, and of course, uh, not having those residues in the products that aren't labeled with those. We track recalls and recall alerts. This is just information from historical perspective across FDA inspected product, USDA inspected product. Again, we see those unfortunately an increasing trend over uh, quite a few years uh, with recalls associated with food allergens. We'll see a few of those spikes in 2014, 15 that I'll mention here in a moment. Again, a key issue, a key food safety issue that we need to think about controlling. It's often it's good to know what's contributing to some of these recall issues. Uh, one of the very nice papers by Steve Gendel and colleague Jamie Zhu, when they were, he was at FDA, he went back to the records to take a look at you know, what were contributing to some of those food allergen recalls. So he dug into what reports uh, they had available. He had identified 732 allergen recalls in that time frame. Of course, again, these are products that are in ingredients in the uh, facilities, uh, milk, egg, wheat, so forth. Uh, again, contributed to a number of those recalls. We look across where we're seeing them. Again, not unexpected because these are where we often see the different allergens controlled. We see differences perhaps in uh, how we may go about, as we heard Monty talk about, wet cleaning versus dry cleaning, some of the other areas. But yet, if I just look at this data in isolation, I still don't know what the root cause is. So we need to take a deeper dive. And if we look at, again, where we're seeing some of those recalls, um, for the different allergens. Uh, we can see those in different uh, areas more specifically, but let's take a dive at where the informa information we know, um, what contributed to those. And it's usually where we spend a lot of time and we've talked a lot about hygienic design and cleaning and so forth, really controlling cross contact. Uh, we do a pretty good job overall. Uh, not to say we should become lax with that because there's a lot of uh, due diligence that we need to continue to improve on. But we see more issues with labeling. That's an area that was highlighted in FSMA. There's automation that could help here. Computer errors, for example, where we talk about uh, 
uh, label design and version control, uh, different controls within the industry uh, and facilities, controls within your packaging supplier. You know, did we send the right electronic version? How are we controlling those type of things? So again, I think we can learn a lot from some of the challenges we've had in the past so we don't continue to make those uh, mistakes. But it's difficult. A lot of times those recalls don't have a lot of information, so you have to dig pretty deep uh, in order to figure out you know, what was that root cause. We tried to do that uh, as a subsequent to that 2007 to 2012 timeframe, um, and we saw a few similar trends in what data we could find. So again, failure to declare, so ingredient statement type issues, um, errors from labels from the supplier, uh, old labels, so didn't control obsolete stock, getting it out of the facility, uh, putting it in a place in lock and key, so forth. Um, packaging, again, one of the key causes of allergen-related recalls, wrong product, wrong package. And then uh, very more limited, but inadequate cleaning, uh, but lack of documentation. Didn't do that pre-op review. Uh, if we don't document, did it get done? Uh, we did have those spikes that I mentioned, and I think as part of supplier verification, uh, we're digging deeper and deeper upstream. And we had a couple of issues back in uh, the 2014 to 2016 timeframe that contributed to quite a bit of that spike, and one of them was peanut and cumin. Uh, it's imported cumin that was um, I'll venture to say perhaps adulterated. The so levels we were seeing up to about 10% peanut and cumin. It's hard to believe that that's a mistake that occurred. Um, again, subsequent to that, we saw a lot of testing of different ingredients and we're seeing perhaps agricultural commingling issues that take place in some of these areas. That again, contributed to a large number of recalls here in the US, Canada, and the EU. So. Uh, a very substantial issue, but I think we're gonna continue to see some of these things as we uh, evaluate and, and do that supplier audit. How well is the supplier ha handling allergens? What are their controls? Upstream, how are their suppliers uh, controlling allergens as well? Another example was 2016 in southern US where we had a peanut and wheat flour issue. This one we believe might have been a transport issue where uh, peanut meal was being hauled northward uh, and some wheat was being hauled back to southern Georgia for milling. So again, understanding that supply chain and understanding where those risks may occur is an important part of the review process, important part of that preventive evaluation. So again, we need to think about those supplier verification, uh, thinking about that international supply chain, commodity transport, uh, and perhaps even the commingling side, uh, really thinking from farm to fork as we go through the process. We're also thinking about different allergens, different sources, uh, and we have our list. We had the big eight. Um, now we have sesame added, so I've heard top nine, big nine. Uh, we haven't settled on a catchphrase yet in that regard, but note that as of January 1 of this upcoming 2023, we are now gonna be managing sesame as the ninth allergen here in the US, similar to Canada, EU, and others. So again, uh, we need to be prepared for those type of things. Knowing the allergens and some of the dynamics around the allergenic sources is important as we'll talk about a little bit later. Again, we're thinking about proteins when we think about allergens, but we need to think about the overall matrix as well. Generally speaking, allergens are very heat stable. They're resistant to heat, resistant to proteolysis, digestion. They're usually the major sources of protein in those different allergenic sources as well. So you're gonna get a, an abundant dose of that protein uh, when we think about allergenic components. There are differences. We can think about uh, food allergens in con conjunction with good hygiene, uh, good food safety practices, but w allergens aren't quite like microbes. So we, allergens don't grow. If we have that single micro uh, biological cell, uh, E. coli, for example, 
We don't get exponential growth with proteins, luckily. So one of the key is removal of that residue, as you heard Monty talk about just a little bit ago. So we have the advantage that we don't have that uh, ability to have exponential growth of, of those proteins. Once it's there, it's there, we can remove it. But that, again, imparts some challenges as well. The other thing I commonly hear about is, well, we could use a, quote, kill step. So we can heat the protein, and uh, that'll get rid of the allergen. So I'm just going to turn up my baking oven, and uh, we'll just burn it off. That'll take care of it. Well, again, when we think about proteins, we have that folded structure. Let's think about what we think from an immunological standpoint. We have antibodies. So this could be the antibody that we have in our system uh, from our immune system, the IgE antibodies that recognize different areas of the protein. So that's a confirmational epitope, recognizes the folds of the protein. But our body likes to build in a lot of redundancy. We're not going to just stop there. We want to recognize different sections of the protein so that we can, again, build that immune response. So I might have a linear epitope. So that antibody recognizes a linear portion of that protein sequence. So I have, again, that redundancy. So I could apply heat, and I'm going to denature that protein. So denaturation, by definition, means I'm unfolding the three-dimensional tertiary quaternary structure, uh, secondary structure, perhaps. And I have that uh, protein sequence, but it's, again, not in its native state. So let's think about those antibodies again. That conformational epitope, um, that might have been disrupted, so I don't see that binding. But remember, we've got a lot of redundancy, so I might still have that uh, linear epitope that my body still recognizes and reacts to. So unless we really uh, crank up the heat to a point, perhaps, that uh, really ashes the protein, we won't necessarily know if it's going to render it non-allergenic. By the way, when we think about detection, though, the same issues apply. We're going to be looking at, if we use ELISA, we're going to have antibody binding. Can we assure that we don't have lack of protein solubility or binding that's contributing to lack of detection versus uh, lack of immuno uh, of reactivity to that protein? We can't necessarily prove or disprove that. So again, the important part is we need to remove the soils. Um, again, through a lot of the different things we've heard about over the last couple of days. So again, focus on that physical removal to minimize cross-contact. Holistically, if we think about allergen control, and again, we're not going to go into great detail on all of this. Um, we, with 30 minutes or so, uh, we can't do justice to all the different topics. But again, we think about all of the different aspects throughout the entire process of uh, developing an allergen control program, identifying those hazards, thinking about even product development, the conceptual design before we even bring allergens in the, the facility is important because we need to start preparing. Does it have that physical or functional capacity that we need in the product that's worthwhile bringing into the facility? But why introduce a new allergen into the facility if it's not needed, if it doesn't have that functional capacity or need for texture or other types of, of items. So we want to think about it and think about bringing a lot of different individuals into the discussion around new concepts. That holds true for really every aspect we have with that training and educational component being one of the key things. Again, you heard this from Ben this morning thinking about FSMA. We look at allergens, uh, chemical hazards. Uh, we think about that harp C process to really think about managing allergens and do so using GMPs and preventive controls, identifying where those risks may occur and making sure that we can prevent that occurrence. Again, we focus on GMPs, those CGMPs 
are an important part of the process of controlling food allergens and thinking about uh, where we should apply GMPs versus those preventive controls. So again, you can look at part 117 to really begin to identify some of those different areas. Similar to what you saw this morning, we want to think about different capacities from personnel through equipment, plant design, uh, utensils, and so forth when we think about GMPs as applied to food allergens. Internationally, there's attention to food allergens as well. And I'll point to this document. Uh, it's an update to the Codex Code of Practice on Food Allergen Management. Uh, that was completed in 2020. Uh, really, again, a updated focus, really farm to fork type focus on food allergen management. So again, thinking about it from a food business operator perspective into uh, retail and food service as well. Uh, but really, again, a good document to think about internationally where we are thinking about food allergen management. Codex also updated the general principles of food hygiene, where they elevated some of the discussion around food allergens as well. So again, important part to think about and know what's going on internationally. So let's go back to some of that effective management, and we'll focus in a little bit on how we manage. And Again, won't go into great detail on cleaning design because Monty talked um, really nice about dry cleaning and some of the other methodologies. We heard this this morning, and I think this is an important part, thinking about forming a good team that has multiple perspectives, multiple eyes on the food safety risk or challenge at hand is a very valuable tool that we can utilize Getting those individuals that uh, have that experience, have a uh, different mindset, different eyes on things can be quite valuable. Great example I heard about just a couple weeks ago from a, a company, I've heard this one oh, probably 10 years ago, but it just reiterates uh, the need to have a cross-functional team. So a company was uh, producing a product that contained an aller allergenic powder. Um, they had a formulation change. Um, fortunately, that didn't get communicated well to the uh, manufacturing facility. The procurement individual on the allergen management team noted that they were still purchasing a lot of that same allergenic powdered material and brought that to the team in question. Well, I thought we made this formulation change. Well, indeed they did except uh, they had the label change, they had all that element, but they had an undeclared allergen, uh, luckily still in control. But it was caught by the fellow on the team that looked at it from uh, procuring the ingredients. So again, great example of the value of that cross-functional team. Again, bringing in uh, those individuals that have uh, equipment design, maintenance abilities, uh, allow you to really look at some of the challenges and how can we address some of those in inventive ways that can help get us access or uh, what's capable or what is reasonable and practical is an important part of the process. We need to understand and identify where those hazards may be. Uh, and we can do this through a mapping process. And again, drawing out the facility, really starting to think about how individuals flow, how do ingredients flow through the facility, uh, how to finish product. Uh, we heard this morning, how does the trash get carried out? All important elements when you think about controlling allergens as well doesn't have to be a complex process. And sometimes I see that uh, individuals make it a little too complex. Um, don't uh, get caught up in the minutia, uh, get lost amongst the trees in the forest when you're really trying to look at uh, allergen management as well as just general food safety and hygiene management practice. There are tools available. Um, I just highlight this one from the Allergen Bureau of Australia and New Zealand, uh, just as an example that provide some automated and guidance to kind of walk you through uh, and help you identify some of the different areas, asking key questions where you can put input some of the information as well. There's emerging tools and opportunity here, I think, uh, to help go through the process for allergen control, as well as other food safety uh, control and considerations as well. 
The other important part is to understand the allergens themselves. So what are our allergenic ingredients? How are they used in the formulation? So thinking about from a protein load, what are our high level risk? So things like casein that have a high level of uh, milk protein present versus those that might have lower amounts like lactose, still have protein, still derived from a milk uh, ingredient. So it's derived from milk and needs to be labeled. But you can start to think about you know, what is that protein load and how, how might that affect our ability to detect and ability to remove uh, when we're thinking about um, allergen removal and cleaning processes. Scheduling is another important part. Uh, often get the question of, in a dry cleaning sense, where do we have a good break um, in dry cleaning or between formulations? Do we have to do a full clean? Uh, what constitutes a full clean in a dry cleaning sense? So it's important here to start to map where you see those changeovers and try to minimize those. We don't want to have a lot of downtime, so you want to build on your allergen profile if possible and identify in a reasonable sense where you can uh, have those cleaning breaks without being uh, becoming too prescriptive, you know, so we don't have a downtime after each formulation. So we might have milk, and then we might have a milk and egg containing product. We can build on that portfolio and build upon that allergen profile. We do need to make a good break in between those different formulations. So you employ the different cleaning strategies that Monty had talked about uh, to try to make sure we can get to a visually clean standard and then support that perhaps through analytical evaluations. Don't forget labeling. Uh, it was identified in FSMA. It's one of the key areas. We see it from recalls uh, where we're going to, again, have a lot of focused by inspectors and others, investigators. Uh, again, it's been a challenge. We need to continue to be diligent. And again, here's where automation can help, but you have to make sure there's, again, some fail safe built into that automation as well. Cleaning changeovers is another key area we think about to control allergens. So we're looking at equipment design. How well can we access the equipment? Uh, if we can't access it, can we assure that it's clean? Uh, in some ways, we can utilize different techniques, CIP, CO, COP, flushes, so forth, that help the process. We heard again several times today training and then not only pre presenting how we have to clean it, but why it's important. I think that's the key. We get hung up in how. We want to make sure it's consistent, but we need that buy-in. We need that training uh, so that individuals understand why we're doing what we're doing. Dry cleaning, as you heard, uh, does present some challenges, but I think there's, again, opportunity and we can get there with food allergens as well. Other key considerations with allergens, we're looking at not only the allergenic ingredient and the different proteins, but we're thinking about the food matrix as well that that is formulated into that we're trying to remove. Keep in mind, foods are a rather complex set of chemistry. We have proteins, we have carbohydrates, we have lipids, we've got phenolic compounds, all of which like to do different things in combination. Then we add heat processing or other unit operations that can change that dynamic as well. So we need to think about not only the allergenic component, but that overall matrix. Think about the equipment. Again, how well can we access the equipment? What type of uh, cleaning can be employed for that particular evaluation as well? Can we do wet cleaning? Can we do dry cleaning? Uh, and we don't want to trade one food safety risk for the other. So it's got to be a balance, as we've heard uh, many times over the last couple days. So here's a slide that I adopt, adapted from Heidi Howe, who was with Ecolab at the time. Uh, and this really, again, highlights the differences in what we think about soil types. And this is where I would say, you know, access and take advantage of, of reaching out to technical experts like Rick and others who know this chemistry and know the balance. They know uh, what chemistry can help 
in removing different types of soils. And again, we're gonna be playing a role in trying to remove multiple, multiple components at one time. Uh, but we have to make sure we don't do that in lieu of uh, damaging equipment or introducing perhaps moisture where we don't want to have moisture in the facility. So there's that balance, and that's where those technical experts can definitely help you. And again, we want to think about that different chemistry for different types of soils, minerals, uh, proteins, uh, fats, and so forth. So again, thinking about... Uh, different types, we have wet cleaning. Uh, you heard a lot about dry cleaning from Monty just a moment ago. Uh, those are often uh, very effective ways of getting uh, different removal of soils uh, through you know, really that mechanical action. But we have to make sure we don't uh, basically remove one soil and uh, have it migrate to another area. So be careful about using things like uh, air compressed, compressed air, uh, steam, so forth. Because again, you want to make sure you're not uh, challenging yourself in the overall system. I've heard things in the past about using pigs, different types of things to scour the internal portions of piping. Uh, again, have their place perhaps, but don't uh, you know, don't use that, and, and then be, have an issue with. Uh, the integrity of the pig itself, uh, where you might have uh, foreign material issues as well. So you wanna, again, keep that balance that we have. So ensuring that we've removed the soil. Again, visual assessments can be quite important here. Um, I think it's been our standard and continues to be a key standard, uh, especially for food allergens. We need to visually inspect the different areas uh, and access points, so we need to be able to see the different points throughout our systems. Uh, again, this can be a critical part if we're thinking about particulate type allergen residue. So sesame seeds, for example, can be quite a challenge. Uh, particulates like tree nut particulates, peanut particulates, Visual assessment is going to be important because I can't come up with a good sampling strategy from an analytical perspective that's going to assure me that I can account for all those particulates. So again, you want to think about the different tools you have available in that balance. We can use those tools to help validate. So you can use analytical tools like those allergen-specific lateral flow devices, ELISAs, um, maybe general protein ATP for routine basis. Uh, again, but think about those type of soils that you're trying to track. We recommend using those ELISAs because they're allergen specific. They give you a sense of have you removed the uh, ingredient or allergen of, of concern. So um, I could look for milk proteins if that's the allergen that I'm most concerned about in my changeover, for example. ATP and general protein aren't going to give you that specificity, but certainly do play a role in uh, routine analysis or verification standpoints as well. So again, all of those tools are there, but they're there to support the cleaning methodology and the validation of that cleaning. They aren't there as your crutch to say, I didn't detect it, so it's obviously clean. It's a part of the process. So it's uh, only a tool to help support that. And last thing, change management. And that's sometimes something we overlook occasionally. When we have changes in the system, we may have to consider revalidation. Doesn't automatically say that we have to revalidate the system. But you should get that team together. Did that new PC equipment, how does that change the dynamic? How well can we clean it? A formulation change, does that make a difference in cleanability and what we want to think about? That might trigger the need to revalidate, but you want to get your team together to discuss that and then decide where to implement that change and revalidate if needed. Just a few different uh, highlights from allergen control very generally. There's a lot of resources out there. So again, this is a small snapshot. Use those resources. Use industry best practice. And again, we're here in a non-competitive uh, state to really work together to try to control and, and manage food allergens. 
Another one in development that uh, is part of ILSI Europe. It's coming out with guidance to really start to think about how we can apply allergen controls from both a qualitative and quantitative evaluation. St so starting to think about how we can employ some of the information we're learning and starting to understand about reactive doses and thinking about how we can apply that in understanding risk-based processes for maybe labeling, such as a precautionary label, for example. So again, stay tuned. That should hopefully be back out in a few, couple months or so. But again, a lot of tools out there to utilize. So with that, I thank you for your time. Are there any questions? <laughs>